we are in a series that is leading us up to Easter to remind us that Jesus' birth and life and death and resurrection saves. It doesn't save just good people like you and me. It, it, it saves the person who is lost, the person who's lost their way in this life, the person who doesn't know Christ, the person who is far from God. Jesus came to save anyone and everyone who cries out his name. And so we're looking at what that means as we approach Easter. And so we're in a sermon series trying to prepare our hearts because oftentimes we in the free church type movement, a non-liturgical worship, we kind of just wake up one day and it's Sunday when other denominations, other followers of Christ have been preparing their hearts and preparing their souls for that moment. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the last few hours of Jesus' life and looking at the people that Jesus gets placed before and then looking at their response to him, trying to discover what our response ought to be when we have Jesus in front or Jesus before us. And what we're doing is kind of taking all four of the Gospels, putting them all together and telling the same story so that we might understand what did Jesus go through, what did he experience, and what can that teach us about how we need to place him before everything in our own lives. And what we did last week is we kind of walked through a little bit of the timeline of what Jesus faced in those last few hours of that Passion Week. Jesus was betrayed by one of the twelve, turned him in as, as somebody to, to, to go to before the authorities. Judas was his name, and Judas betrays Jesus, and then Jesus goes before a series of court-like proceedings, first starting with Annas, who was the high priest, and he was the one who was supposed to be the high priest, but because the high priest's position was so valuable in the Jewish culture politically that he had corrupted it so that he would pass it around to his friends and his family members, and he would still have that position and authority. And so first he goes in front of Annas, who is the, I call him the godfather of the high priest, then to his son-in-law Caiaphas, who is the reigning, uh, the reigning high priest, the one who is currently that role. And then he goes before the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish Supreme Court, and they're trying to get a, a verdict that Jesus should be executed because he is causing trouble among the Jewish leaders. And that, that's where we stopped last week, and we'll pick up that story, the rest of that, today. But when we talked about last week, and if you missed this sermon last week, you really need to go back and watch it online, because we discovered that within the religious leaders of the time, they were making a mistake that you and I are prone to. And that mistake was the religious leaders are trying to enforce rules and rituals without a heart change. They're trying to force people to believe a certain way and act a certain way, but without something happening on the inside, it's just really futile. In fact, rituals and rules without relationship, relationship leads only to resentment, which ultimately leads to rejection not only of the rituals and the rules, but those who represent those rituals and rules. And sometimes you and I make the same mistake when we're trying to get everybody to act like us without them knowing Jesus first. And so we can be in trouble when we do that, and as less and less people believe the gospel, we're going to have to start with the gospel, not with some exterior activities to try to get them to do to be accepted by us. Why is that such a problem? Well, because rules and rituals, those of us who are religious, give us a power to enforce other people to do what we want them to do. And the church oftentimes can be accused, and rightfully so, of using power and position to try to influence people to act a certain way without thinking about their hearts. Because oftentimes, if we get to enforce the rules, we have a value in ourselves. We begin to think that we're important, we have position, we have value. It's exactly what happened to the Jewish leaders. They, they betrayed Jesus. They executed him because he was a threat to their power. Months before, Jesus goes in front of all these groups that I've talked to you about, Lazarus has been healed by Jesus from the dead. And because of that, people came to watch and see what was going on, and they were wondering, is Jesus real or not? So the religious leaders, that Sanhedrin, got together before that last week, and they asked themselves, what are we supposed to do? Because this man's performing many signs. He's raising up dead people. That draws attention. That draws attraction to people. And so they believe that if we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe in him, 
a horrible thing, right? And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Because religion likes to go before Jesus, and religion has a tendency to drown out Jesus, and our goal is to put Jesus before religion. That's what we talked about last week. Today we're going to look at really the government and the Roman authorities that Jesus gets placed in front of and ask the question, what happens when Jesus goes before the government? And I know some of you are really excited about this because you're theological conservatives and you're political conservatives and, and you are excited about these kind of things. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about government, what its role and responsibility is, what the church's role and responsibility is, and how if we're not careful, we'll be making the same mistakes that our government is currently making. Because we're looking now, not at Annas, Caiaphas, or the Sanhedrin, we're looking that after the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, if you will, has declared Jesus guilty and deserving of death, they go and take him before the governmental authorities. In this particular location, it is an under ruler called Pilate. Pontius Pilate has been under the authority of the Roman Empire, and so he represents Rome over Jerusalem. Jesus is brought to him, as we're going to examine here in just a moment in John 18, then he sends him off to Herod because Jesus is actually a Galilean and trying to avoid having to make a decision. Hearing that Herod's in town sends Jesus before Herod. And then Herod rejects that and sends him back to Pilate. And Pilate makes this final decision. So if you've got your Bibles today, we're in John chapter 18, <clears throat> kind of the second half of John 18. <clears throat> and what we're doing is we are looking at the events when Jesus is placed before the government, where Jesus is placed before the Roman authority of Pontius Pilate. Now, after a long night, the Jews have brought Jesus in front of Pilate. They can't go into his courtyard because that would defile them and they would not be able to participate in the religious festivals that are going on in the, because there are so many millions of Jews in town because of those religious festivals. And the religious leaders would look bad if they were unable to do that. So they kind of send someone to knock at Pilate's door we assume it's very early in the morning. Pilate comes to the door, probably half asleep, probably waking, going, hey, what's going on? And they say, hey, we've got this guy named Jesus, and we decided that you need to kill him. That's what they decided to do. And Pilate's going, well, before I kill him, I'm going to talk to him. Because even, even though I'm a Roman, even though I'm Pontius Pilate, I do have my standards. And so I want to talk to this guy. So he brings Jesus in, and he brings this conversation, which, seemed, which may be the most in incredible conversation that Jesus ever had with anyone. So Pilate entered his headquarters, bringing Jesus in, and said to him, Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered with a question. Now, I don't know if you've ever been pulled over by a police officer or not, but when they ask you a question, you should answer their question. Do not ask them a question from your question. That never worked with my father, who when he asked a question wanted an answer to ask a question, and it will not work with the police officer. When the police officer comes and knocks on the window, and you roll it down and say, Yes, sir, how are you doing today? Good to see you, sir. Hey, you looking sharp in that uniform. You are such a wonderful guy. Thank you for being here and enforcing the law. That's what you say, right? Because you want to do everything you can to get that person on your side. You say, Yes, sir, and no, sir, unless it's a female. And then you say, Yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. And you want to be really careful that you get that right with the police officer. And you do everything you can to get him on your side, get her on your side. So you're doing all those things, and you're being polite, you're being sweet, you're nice. Jesus, when he's asked a question by Pilate, responds with a question. It probably blew Pilate away because Pilate is the authority, he has power, he has position, and he may, Jesus may have been the first person who goes up against him and asks questions of the authority. Jesus answered, you call me king of the Jews. Is that something you came up with, Pilate? Or did somebody tell you to say that? That's not exactly what he said. He said, do you say this on your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Meaning, this is a religious matter. I'm not a religious person. I don't understand what you're talking about. I do not know what your rules are, are that I know. is that the, your nation, your chief priest, have delivered me over to you, and they want me to kill you. What have you done to deserve death? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Pilate says, so you're a king, right? <laughs> Jesus kind of says, well, if you want to think of it that way, that's fine. 
Because Pilate, you think you're king over everything. You think you're somebody. I'm telling you, there's another authority. There's another kingdom that is so much more important, so much more powerful than yours. It doesn't even compare. But if you want to think of me as a king, that's all right. Think of me as a king. But here's the reason that I'm here. I am here for this purpose. I was born. And for this purpose, I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate had never had anyone speak to him like that. And so being a good politician, he asks, rhetorically, probably, what is truth? Now, I don't know everything there is to know about Pilate, but Pilate has been involved in the political system for a long time. And I think he's kind of warped by this time. Politics has a tendency to do that to you, doesn't it, over time? And I think he's asking a sarcastic question. What is truth? Meaning there is no such thing as truth. Meaning that truth is whatever we need it to be. That truth can be manipulated. Truth can be anything we want to make it to to say or believe. And so I understand this. So you want to talk about truth. There is no such thing as absolute truth. I love it when someone says that to me. Because when they say that, I say, excuse me, did you just say that there is absolutely no truth? They said, yes, there are absolutely no truths. So, well, excuse me, you just made an absolute truth statement saying that there's not an absolute truth. Therefore, I agree with you that there is no truth saying that there was truth, so I'm on your side. So since there's one truth, there must be more truths. Let's discover them together. To which they look at me like, huh? Because you can't make a statement as saying there is no truth without making the statement that there is truth or you couldn't be able to declare that there's no truth. There must be some kind of truth. But whether or not Pilate meant the question to be serious or not, It is the correct question. Pilate asked the right question because the government is designed and their purpose is to understand and know what truth is. My son is on his way back from a trip to Europe. He's been there for a week. It's been a pretty amazing thing today that I was able to FaceTime him as he's in his room in Barcelona and I'm driving down the highway in all places, of all places, Arkansas, and I can watch him on the screen and he can watch me on the screen and isn't it amazing what technology can do? But my son called me on FaceTime and we were able to to look at each other and he said to me, hey dad, I bought something really cool. I said, really? Yes, I've been in Toledo today. I'm like, Ohio? I thought I sent you to Europe. That was a whole lot more expensive than to go into to, to Toledo. No, 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 Dad. It's Toledo. And how many of you know what Toledo is famous for? Raise your hand if you know what Toledo is famous for. We have one person down front. What is Toledo famous for? Swords. So my son bought a sword. Now, I haven't got to see this sword yet. I asked him to, to not carry it on the plane, is what I asked him to do. I know they've made some adjustments in the TSA authorities, but I don't think they include swords. But he has bought himself a sword and having it shipped home so that we'll have a sword in my home. Now, why in the world would a young boy, 13, 14-year-old kid, why in the world never wants to go shopping, was eager to go shopping on that day they went to Toledo? Why? Because when you have a sword, you're somebody, right? I mean, if you take a sword today and you walk around, you get people's attention when you walk around with a sword today. And when you have a sword, you walk around saying, you know what, I'm bad because I've got a sword. And look, none of y'all have a sword, but I've got a sword, so I've got power. In fact, the only time that you're not concerned whether you have a sword or not is when you find somebody who's bigger than you, and they have a sword. And then you take your sword, and you hide your sword. But most of the other time, you've got your sword, and you're ready to do battle because you're tough if you've got a sword. And with two boys in our homes, swords might be a popular thing. We don't let them play with swords. We don't let them have swords. The closest thing they have is the Christmas paper wrapping. The interior part of that, the little, that kind of cardboard. I mean, know I'm talking about that you, there we go. Everybody, yeah, I'm in on that. That's the closest thing to a sword that we have. But he's got to get a sword. He's bringing that home, and now he's going to be tough and big and bad because he's got a sword. Well, do you know that God has granted the government the sword? In fact, if you read Romans chapter 13, you will recognize that the government is designed by God to carry the sword to enforce the rules. In fact, I was traveling back to Arkansas, and there were lots of law enforcement officers hoping to enforce the law as they saw my car coming down the highway. Fortunately, I did not give them an opportunity this time to enforce the law. But they're sitting there, and they enjoy that role. They want to enforce the law. They want to, in fact, if you read Romans 13 very carefully, the role of the government is very simple. They've been given a sword the power, the position, to punish those who do wrong. 
That's the reason God has created government. God created government. It wasn't our idea. It was his idea. And their job is to carry the sword and enforce laws and punish people who break the law. That's their job. They also are to protect or to reward those who do right. So that if you're doing what's right, you're not supposed to be worried. Which is why some of you, when you're driving along and you see a police officer, you slam on your brakes. Because even though you're going under the speed limit, you know that they're to enforce that law. That's the role of government. It is not the role of the church to enforce rules. It is not the role of church to enforce laws upon people because every time, historically speaking, the church has had the power to do that and carry the sword, we have performed very, very poorly. Because the church's responsibility is not to enforce rules or regulations. That is the government's role and responsibility. That's the reason Baptists were at the forefront of a separation of church and state. Not as the way that we apply it today. Separation of God and state. Oh, not, that's not at all. What we've always said is that the church should never carry the sword. But here's what the church ought to do. The church must influence, and Christians must influence the one who carries the sword because most of the time they may or may not know what is true. They may or may not know what is right. And so what happens is when I carry the sword, whatever I have a tendency to think of as being right ends up being right, doesn't it? Why? Because I've got the sword. Which makes Nathan's response in 2 Samuel incredible to David because David has gone outside of the rules. If you remember, he had taken uh, Uriah, one of his best guards. He had taken his wife, had Uriah killed, moved him into his harem. And all of a sudden, one day, Nathan comes, knocks on the door, knock, knock, knock. Got a little story to tell you. <laughs> story is this guy's got a lot of sheep. But then he goes over and steals the guy beside him, takes the sheep, kills the guy. David's furious. Anybody read this story? David's furious. You remember what Nathan said? You're the man. That's the role of the church. The role of Christians, the role of the church, is to go to the government and say, hey, this is right, that's not right. This is what you're supposed to do, this is not what you're supposed to do. Don't give us the sword, we don't want the sword, not our job to carry the sword. Our job is to influence the carriers of the sword. What's the problem? Well, there's two problems. One, sometimes the church seeks to align itself with government too closely because there's something about power that attracts all of us, doesn't it? I've been to lots of cities, uh, not necessarily around the world, but a lot of cities, and every city hums. But the city of Washington, D.C. hums at a whole other level because there's power there. And if the church is not careful, we seek to find power. And we align ourselves with government. We're going to see how that make, becomes a mistake here in just a moment. But the bigger problem that's happening within our culture today is that the government rejects biblical wisdom. The government no longer looks to the Scriptures, no longer looks to God, no longer looks to our Creator, if nothing else, who at the beginning of our Constitution, the found, founding principles of our nation, that it is God who grants all these freedoms, God who grants all these rights and liberties and all those things. We have rejected that, rejected those things, and so what happens is the government begins to do whatever it thinks is right, and because it's got the sword, it's really hard to stand up against that. In fact, that's what Jesus gets subjected to. The Son of God, who is perfect in all ways, never broken any kind of laws, never done anything wrong, he is the one, when Pilate rejects biblical wisdom, Jesus ends up suffering. So after asking Jesus what is truth and then not giving Jesus a chance to answer the truth, the question, goes back out, has Jesus beaten, flogged, some scriptures say, takes them out, brings them back in, and tries to get the Jews to say, hey, that was enough, just let him go. But the Jews say, this man claims to be the son of God. In verse 8, chapter 19, and that worries Pilate. I don't know if it worries Pilate because of what the Jews may or may not do, thinking this is a God or not a God, or whether it's from Pilate's own Roman background, a pagan background who believed in gods, whether he was afraid that this man was actually a God or not. We don't really know, but we know that this made him very, very nervous. In fact, his wife also comes in, according to Matthew's story and says, hey, don't mess with this guy. There's something special about him. And whether that was God who sent that to her, whether that was Satan trying to mess up this plan that God had designed, we don't know. But Pilate is very, very nervous. And so he brings Jesus back in and he asks Jesus a question again. He says, where are you from? Now this may be a question of whether you're from Jerusalem or Galilee, but it may be a bigger question. But Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said, you do not understand. 
Why are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Don't you know I've got the sword? <clears throat> Jesus, aren't you scared of the sword? And Jesus is like, I'm not scared of your sword. <laughs> I'm not scared of your sword. In fact, you would have no authority over me <laughs> at all unless it had been given from you from above. Isn't that a good statement? Now, that's not just a good statement to Pilate. That's a good statement to whatever national government we're under. Say, you got authority, no doubt. You got the sword. We'll battle the sword. But listen, we serve a God who's got a bigger sword than your sword. And you may slay us, but he's got the final say in all this matter. Because you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given from you above. Therefore, whoever delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And from then on, Pilate said, I don't want to have anything to do with this guy. This is not a guy that I've ever dealt with before. Most people come in here, they're scared of the sword. Woo, scared of the sword. This guy's not scared. In fact, he asks he asked questions when I ask questions. And he's got better answers than I have when he asks them. And so he's trying to figure out how to get out of this. But the Jews keep crying out, if you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. Do you see the church then aligning with the government? Because, because... Pilate knows that he's under the authority of somebody else. He may not recognize God as the authority, but he recognizes the emperor as the authority. And the emperor that's currently under Pilate is not the emperor that elected him in the first place. And so he's concerned that if he blows this thing and Jerusalem goes into trouble and goes into chaos and there's rebellion, that he's going to lose his position, his power, his authority. And so that bothers him. And then the church goes on to say, hey, whoever makes himself a king opposes Caesar. See the church lining up with that? So what does he do? Well, he goes out and has him all these other kind of things, but then he finally comes back and he makes a decision that he's going to make a decision on this case <clears throat> based on expediency. Now, this is not him booking a vacation online. Okay, that's Expedia. Okay, that's Expedia.com. This is the word expediency. <clears throat> what is the good definition of expediency or expedient? The decision is expedient means to be convenient and practical, although possibly improper or immoral. That's what it means to be expedient. It means to look at everything and try to figure out kind of something close to the truth, but something that makes it easier for you. It kind of looks and goes, okay, that's just truth, but, but this would be easier, it's more convenient, it's more practical, because you know sometimes the truth is costly. Do you, do you know that sometimes? The truth makes you do things that you may or may not want to do that are not necessarily easy, not necessarily comfortable. And so what he decides to do, being a politician... He looks around and goes, well, you know what? This is not worth me getting in trouble for. Let's just kind of go along with things. Because if I stand up against this, you know, this could go bad for me. So why don't we just give in a little bit? And this is the easy thing. It's the quick thing. It's the convenient thing. It's the practical thing. And so he, he brings Jesus back in, brings him out in front of everybody. And Pilate asks again, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. See that final move of the church there to, to manipulate the sword to get things the way that they want them to be? So what does Pilate eventually have to do? He finally has to deliver him over to be crucified. And Jesus is crucified by the Roman government based on Pilate's authority, based on the term of expediency. Because they placed, Pilate's placed expediency before truth. Now, all of us know this happens today, doesn't it? We all know that the government does these things. They make decisions, not, not best for the people, not caring really what the truth really is. What they're trying to do is what's easier, simple, and what benefits themselves. That, that's what the government does. Wouldn't you say that's mainly what the government does? Not always, but that's what it does oftentimes. But you know what? That kind of sounds like you and me too, doesn't it? Don't you and I sometimes know, well, the truth is this, but you know, if we just shade it a little bit over here, it'd be kind of okay. You know, it's tax season coming up right now. You know that? Hope you got your taxes in. And you and, you and I are the same. We're going to try to get every benefit we can from our tax system, aren't we? We're going to take every write-off that's possible. We're going to take every benefit. We're going to do all those kind of things. Nothing wrong with that. But the wrongness of that is if we take more than is available to us and we think nobody will know. Or maybe in your business. You show up at your business and your job is not to be on the Internet 45 minutes checking Facebook and all those other kind of things. <clears throat> but you're going, you know what, I've worked hard, I've gotten here earlier, da, 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 da. that's okay. Maybe some of you are in relationships that you know are not quite right, the person that you're living with is not somebody that you're married to, and you go, God forgives that, God understands that, and so what you are doing is you are placing expediency before the truth, and there is a danger in that. Because the truth is the truth, 
And so many times you and I live as if the truth doesn't really matter. God understands our heart. God gets that. So it's going to be okay. So we're going to do what's kind of convenient rather than what's absolutely positively true. We're not going to go fully above board. We're going to be kind of close to that. And that kind of thinking costs Jesus his life. Now, does that mean that somebody's going to die if you and I are expedient instead of truthful? No, but there might be a problem that's coming. Any of y'all have a washing machine? I think I got a washing machine. Anybody got, anybody got a, <clears throat> don't raise your hand on this, but any of y'all got more than one washing machine and, and most of them are outside? Anybody raise your hand like that? This is Taney County, isn't it? <clears throat> well, if you have a washing machine and it's inside, you have a hose kind of like that on your washing machine, don't you? Now, this is not one that I didn't want to pull the washing machine hose off my house, so I borrowed this from someplace else. Okay, and I'll return it, speaking of expediency, okay? But do you know the number one cause of home damage in our country? It's from busted washing machine hoses. Do you know that? Read it, read it, read it, read it on the internet. It's true. I read it. So it's out there. And it says, <laughs> it says that the number one insurance claim costs more money than anything else is a busted washing machine hose. Why is that? Well, the washing machine hose, as you probably know, <laughs> is under a lot of pressure constantly. You know that, right? A lot of a lot of gallons of water go, go through this thing, right? And you and I have a tendency, if we don't see it every day, we have a tendency out of sight, out of mind. Until it loses its flexibility, it loses its integrity, and then one day, knowing that you're on vacation, how the hoses know this, I do not know, but they know, don't they? The inflexibility, the loss of integrity creates a rupture, a crack, and water that was inside goes out everywhere and it messes up everything in its path. Are you losing your integrity right now? If you choose an expediency over truth in your life in some areas, and you go, hey, it's not a big deal. Yes, it is a big deal because it grieves the Holy Spirit, and it lessens your ability to be flexible. And one day, at a very inopportune, inconvenient time, everything that was inside will go out everywhere, damaging all kinds of people, especially those closest to to you. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. Are you choosing a